सती पथना क्यागत सती वाग्गा सूत्र एक्सर्ट्स एंड वन डॉट फाइव सिक्सटी थ्री डैश फाइव सेवेंटी फोर फाइव सिक्सटी थ्री इवन एज वन हू एनकम्पासिस विद इज माइंड द माइटी ओशन इंक्लूड्स देर बाय ऑल द रिव्यूलिट्स दैट रन इन टू द ओशन जस्ट सो ओ मंग्स हू एवर डेवेलप्स एंड कल्टिवेट्स माइंडफुल इज डायरेक्टेड टू द बॉडी इंक्लूड्स देर बाय ऑल द होलसम स्टेट्स दैट पार्टेक ऑफ सुप्रीम नॉलेज फाइव सिक्सटी फोर वन थिंग ओ मंग्स इफ डेवेलप्ड एंड कल्टिवेटेड लीड्स टू अ स्ट्रॉन्ग सेंस ऑफ अर्जेंसी वॉट इज दैट वन थिंग It is mindfulness directed to the body. This one thing, O oh monks, if developed and cultivated, leads to a strong sense of urgency. Five sixty-five. One thing, O oh monks, if developed and cultivated, leads to great benefit. What is that one thing? It is mindfulness directed to the body. This one thing, O oh monks. if developed and cultivated leads to great benefit 566 one thing o oh monks if developed and cultivated leads to great security from bondage what is that one thing it is mindfulness directed to the body this one thing o oh monks if developed and cultivated leads to great security from bondage 567 one thing o oh monks if developed and cultivated leads to mindfulness and clear comprehension what is that one thing it is mindfulness directed to the body this one thing o oh monks if developed and cultivated leads to mindfulness and clear comprehension 568 one thing o oh monks if developed and cultivated leads to the attainment of vision and knowledge What is that one thing? It is mindfulness directed to the body. This one thing, O oh monks, if developed and cultivated, leads to the attainment of vision and knowledge. Five sixty nine. One thing, O oh monks, if developed and cultivated, leads to a pleasant dwelling in this very life. What is that one thing? It is mindfulness directed to the body. This one thing, O oh monks. if developed and cultivated leads to a pleasant dwelling in this very life 570 one thing o oh monks if developed and cultivated leads to the realization of the fruit of knowledge and liberation what is that one thing it is mindfulness directed to the body this one thing o oh monks if developed and cultivated leads to the realization of the fruit of knowledge and liberation 571 if one thing o oh monks is developed and cultivated the body is calmed the mind is calmed discursive thoughts are quieted and all wholesome states that partake of supreme knowledge reach fullness of development what is that one thing it is mindfulness directed to the body if this one thing o oh monks is developed and cultivated the body is calmed the mind is calmed discursive thoughts are quieted and all wholesome states that partake of supreme knowledge reach fullness of development 574 if one thing o oh monks is developed and cultivated ignorance is abandoned supreme knowledge arises delusion of self is given up the underlying tendencies are eliminated and the fetters are discarded what is that one thing it is mindfulness directed to the body If this one thing o oh monks is developed and cultivated ignorance is abandoned supreme knowledge arises delusion of self is given up the underlying tendencies are eliminated and the fetters are discarded mindfulness immersed in the body kyagatsati sutta mn 119 I have heard that on one occasion the blessed one was staying near Swath in Jita's grove and Thapi Kai's monastery. Now at that time a large number of monks after the meal on returning from their alms round had gathered at the meeting hall when this discussion arose isn't it amazing friends isn't it astounding the extent to which mindfulness emerged in the body 
when developed and pursued, is said by the blessed one who knows, who sees, the worthy one, rightly self-awakened, to be of great fruit and great benefit. And this discussion came to no conclusion. Then the blessed one, emerging from his seclusion in the evening, went to the meeting hall and, on arrival, sat down on a seat made ready. As he was sitting there, he addressed the monks, for what topic are you gathered together here? And what was the discussion that came to no conclusion? Just now, Lord, after the meal, on returning from our arms round, we gathered at the meeting hall when this discussion arose, isn't it amazing, friends? Isn't it astounding, the extent to which mindfulness immersed in the body, when developed and pursued, is said by the blessed one who knows, who sees, worthy and rightly self-awakened, to be of great fruit and great benefit. This was the discussion that had come to no conclusion when the blessed one arrived. The blessed one said, And how is mindfulness immersed in the body developed? How is it pursued, so as to be of great fruit and great benefit? There is the case where a monk, having gone to the wilderness, to the shade of a tree, or to an empty building, sits down folding his legs crosswise, holding his body erect and establishing mindfulness to the fore. Always mindful, he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Breathing in long, he discerns, I am breathing in long, or breathing out long, he discerns, I am breathing out long. Or breathing in short, he discerns, I am breathing in short, or breathing out short, he discerns, I am breathing out short. He trains himself, I will breathe in sensitive to the entire body. He trains himself, I will breathe out sensitive to the entire body. He trains himself, I will breathe in coming. Bodily fabrication. He trains himself, I will breathe out coming bodily fabrication. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. And further, when walking, the monk discerns, I am walking. When standing, he discerns, I am standing. When sitting, he discerns, I am sitting. When lying down, he discerns, I am lying down. Or however his body is disposed, that is how he discerns it. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. And further, when going forward and returning, he makes himself fully alert, when looking toward and looking away, when bending and extending his limbs, when carrying his outer cloak, his upper robe, and his ball, when eating, drinking, chewing, and saving, when urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and remaining silent, he makes himself fully alert. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. And further, the monk reflects on this very body from the soles of the feet on up, from the crown of the head on down, surrounded by skin and full of various kinds of unclean things, in this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, tendons, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, gorge, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, skin oil, saliva, mucus, fluid in the joints, urine. Just as if a sack with openings at both ends were full of various kinds of grain, wheat, 
rice, mung beans, kidney beans, sesame seeds, husked rice, and a man with good eyesight, pouring it out, were to reflect, this is wheat. This is rice. These are mung beans. These are kidney beans. These are sesame seeds. This is husked rice. In the same way, the monk reflects on this very body from the soles of the feet on up, from the crown of the head on down, surrounded by skin and full of various kinds of unclean things. In this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, tendons, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, gorge, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, skin oil, saliva, mucus, fluid in the joints, urine. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. And further, the monk contemplates this very body, however it stands, however it is disposed, in terms of properties, in this body there is the earth property, the liquid property, the fire property, and the wine property. Just as a dexterous butcher or his apprentice, having killed a cow, would sit at a crossroads cutting it up into pieces, the monk contemplates this very body, however it stands, however it is disposed, in terms of properties, in this body there is the earth property, the liquid property, the fire property, and the wine property. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. And further, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a charnel ground, one day, two days, three days dead, bloated, livid, and festering, he applies it to this very body, this body, too, such is its nature, such is its future, such its unavoidable fate. Or again, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a charnel ground, picked at by crows, vultures, and hawks, by dogs, hyenas, and various other creatures, a skeleton smeared with flesh and blood, connected with tendons, a fleshless skeleton smeared with blood, connected with tendons, a skeleton without flesh or blood, connected with tendons, bones detached from there. Tendons, scattered in all directions, here a hand bone, there a foot bone, here a shin bone, there a thigh bone, here a hip bone, there a back bone, here a rib, there a chest bone, here a shoulder bone, there a neck bone, here a jaw bone, there a tooth, here a skull, the bones whitened, somewhat like the color of shells, piled up, more than a year old, decomposed into a powder. He applies it to this very body, this body, too, such is its nature, such is its future, such its unavoidable fate. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. The Four Janas And further, quite secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities, he enters and remains in the first jhana, rapture and pleasure born of seclusion accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Just as if a dexterous bathman or bathman's apprentice would pour bath powder into a brass basin and knead it together, sprinkling it again and again with water, so that his ball of bath powder, saturated, moisture permeated within and without, would nevertheless not drip. Even so, the monk permeates this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. 
There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. Then, with the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, he enters and remains in the second jhana, rapture and pleasure born of concentration, unification of awareness. Free from directed thought and evaluation. Internal assurance. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Just like a lake with spring. Water welling up from within having no inflow from the east, west, north, or south, and with the sky supplying abundant showers time and again, so that the cool fount of water welling up from within the lake would permeate and pervade, suffuse and fill it with cool waters, there being no part of the lake unpervaded by the cool waters, even so, the monk permeates, this very body with the rapture and pleasure born of concentration. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by rapture and pleasure born of concentration. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. Then, with the fading of rapture, he remains equanimous, mindful, and alert, and senses pleasure with the body. He enters and remains in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful, he has a pleasant abiding. He permeates and pervades, suffuses and fills this very body with the pleasure divested of rapture. Just as in a lotus pond, some of the lotuses, born and growing in the water, stay immersed in the water and flourish without standing up out of the water, so that they are permeated and pervaded, suffused and filled with cool water from their roots to their tips, and nothing of those lotuses would be unpervaded with cool water, even so, the monk permeates, this very body with the pleasure divested of rapture. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded with pleasure divested of rapture. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. Then, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, as with the earlier disappearance of joys and distresses, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. He sits, permeating the body with a pure, bright awareness. Just as if a man were sitting covered from head to foot with a white cloth so that there would be no part of his body to which the white cloth did not extend, even so, the monk sits, permeating the body with a pure, bright awareness. There is nothing of his entire body unpervaded by pure bright awareness. And as he remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned, and with their abandoning his mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and concentrated. This is how a monk develops mindfulness immersed in the body. Fullness of Mind Monks, Whoever develops and pursues mindfulness immersed in the body encompasses whatever skillful qualities are on the side of clear knowing. Just as whoever pervades the great ocean with his awareness encompasses whatever rivulets flow down into the ocean, in the same way, whoever develops and pursues mindfulness immersed in the body encompasses whatever skillful qualities are on the side of clear knowing. In whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is not developed, not pursued, Mara gains entry, Mara gains a foothold. Suppose that a man were to throw a heavy stone ball into a pile of wet clay. What do you think, monks? 
Would the heavy stone ball gain entry into the pile of wet clay? Yes, Lord. In the same way, in whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is not developed, not pursued, mala gains entry, mala gains a foothold. Now, suppose that there were a dry, sapless piece of timber, and a man were to come along with an upper fire stick, thinking, I will light a fire. I will produce heat. What do you think? Would he be able to light a fire and produce heat by rubbing the upper fire stick in the dry, sapless piece of timber? Yes, Lord. In the same way, in whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is not developed, not pursued, mala gains entry, mala gains a foothold. Now, suppose that there were an empty, hollow water pot set on a stand, and a man were to come along carrying a load of water. What do you think, would he get a place to put his water? Yes, Lord. In the same way, in whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is not developed, not pursued, mala gains entry, mala gains a foothold. Now, in whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is developed, is pursued, mala gains no entry, mala gains no foothold. Suppose that a man were to throw a ball of string against a door panel made entirely of hurtwood. What do you think? Would that light ball of string gain entry into that door panel made entirely of hurtwood? No, Lord. In the same way, in whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is developed, is pursued, mala gains no entry, mala gains no foothold. Now, suppose that there were a wet, sappy piece of timber, and a man were to come along with an upper fire stick, thinking, I will light a fire. I will produce heat. What do you think? Would he be able to light a fire and produce heat by rubbing the upper fire stick in the wet, sappy piece of timber? No, Lord. In the same way, in whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is developed, is pursued, mala gains no entry. Mara gains no foothold. Now, suppose that there were a water pot set on a stand, full of water up to the brim so that crows could drink out of it, and a man were to come along carrying a load of water. What do you think? Would he get a place to put his water? No, Lord. In the same way, in whomever mindfulness immersed in the body is developed, is pursued, Mara gains no entry. Mara gains no foothold. An opening to the higher knowledges. When anyone has developed and pursued mindfulness immersed in the body, then whichever of the six higher knowledges he turns his mind to know and realize, he can witness them for himself whenever there is an opening. Suppose that there were a water jar, set on a stand, brimful of water so that a crow could drink from it. If a strong man were to tip it in any way at all, would water spill out? Yes, Lord. In the same way, when anyone has developed and pursued mindfulness immersed in the body, then whichever of the six higher knowledges he turns his mind to know and realize, he can witness them for himself whenever there is an opening. Suppose there were a rectangular water tank, set on level ground, bounded by dikes, brimful of water so that a crow could drink from it. If a strong man were to loosen the dikes anywhere at all, would water spill out? Yes, Lord. In the same way, when anyone has developed and pursued mindfulness immersed in the body, then whichever of the six higher knowledges he turns his mind to know and realize, he can witness them for himself whenever there is an opening. Suppose there were a chariot on level ground at four crossroads, harnessed to Thoroughbreds, waiting with whips lying ready, so that a dexterous driver, a trainer of tameable horses, might mount and, taking the reins, with his left hand and the whip with his right, drive out and back, to whatever place and by whichever road he liked. In the same way, when anyone has developed and pursued mindfulness immersed in the body, then whichever of the six higher knowledges he turns his mind to know and realize, he can witness them for himself whenever there is an. Opening 10 Benefits Monks, 
For one in whom mindfulness immersed in the body is cultivated, developed, pursued, given a means of transport, given a grounding, steadied, consolidated, and well undertaken, ten benefits can be expected. Which ten? 1. He conquers displeasure and delight, and displeasure does not conquer him. He remains victorious over any displeasure that has arisen. 2. He conquers fear and dread, and fear and dread do not conquer him. He remains victorious over any fear and dread that have arisen. 3. He is resistant to cold, heat, hunger, thirst, the touch of gadflies and mosquitoes, wind and sun and creeping things, to abusive, hurtful language, he is the sort that can endure bodily feelings that, when they arise, are painful, sharp, stabbing, fierce, distasteful, disagreeable, deadly. 4. He can attain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the four jhanas, heightened mental states providing a pleasant abiding in the here and now. 5. He wields manifold supranormal powers. Having been one he becomes many, having been many he becomes one. He appears. He vanishes. He goes unimpeded through walls, ramparts, and mountains as if through space. He dives in and out of the earth as if it were water. He walks on water without sinking as if it were dry land. Sitting cross-legged he flies through the air like a winged bird. With his hand he touches and strokes even the sun and moon, so mighty and powerful. He exercises influence with his body even as far as the Brahm worlds. 6. He hears, by means of the divine ear element, purified and surpassing the human, both kinds of sounds, divine and human, whether near or far. 7. He knows the awareness of other beings, other individuals, having encompassed it with his own awareness. He discerns a mind with passion as a mind with passion, and a mind without passion as a mind without passion. He discerns a mind with aversion as a mind with aversion, and a mind without aversion as a mind without aversion. He discerns a mind with delusion as a mind with delusion, and a mind without delusion as a mind without delusion. He discerns a restricted mind as a restricted mind, and a scattered mind as a scattered mind. He discerns an enlarged mind as an enlarged mind, and an unenlarged mind as an unenlarged mind. He discerns a surpassed mind, one that is not at the most excellent level, as a surpassed mind, and an unsurpassed mind as an unsurpassed mind. He discerns a concentrated mind as a concentrated mind, and an unconcentrated mind as an unconcentrated mind. He discerns a released mind as a released mind, and an unreleased mind as an unreleased mind. 8. He recollects his manifold past lives, lit, previous homes, i. 1 birth, 2 births, 3 births, 4, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1000, 100,000, many eons of cosmic contraction, many eons of cosmic expansion, many eons of cosmic contraction and expansion, recollecting, there I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance. Such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such the end of my life. Passing away from that state, I rearose there. There too I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance. Such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such the end of my life. Passing away from that state, I rearose here. Thus he remembers his manifold past lives in their modes and details. 9. He sees, by means of the divine eye, purified and surpassing the human, beings passing away and reappearing, and he discerns how they are inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate in accordance with their kamma, these beings, who were endowed with bad. Conduct of body, speech, and mind, who revived the noble ones, held wrong views and undertook actions under the influence of wrong views with the breakup of the body, after death, 
have reappeared in a plane of deprivation, a bad destination, a lower realm, hell. But these beings, who were endowed with good conduct of body, speech, and mind, who did not revile the noble ones, who held right views and undertook actions under the influence of right views, with the breakup of the body, after death, have reappeared in the good destination, a heavenly world. Thus, by means of the divine eye, purified and surpassing the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, and he discerns how they are inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate in accordance with their kamma. 10. Through the ending of effluence, he remains in the effluent free awareness release and discernment release, having known and realized them for himself right in the here and now. Monks, for one in whom mindfulness immersed in the body is cultivated, developed, pursued, given a means of transport, given a grounding, steadied, consolidated, and well undertaken, these ten benefits can be expected. That is what the Blessed One said. Gratified, the monks delighted in the Blessed One's words. The Establishing of Mindfulness Discourse Satipahana Sutta, MN 10 I have heard that on one occasion the Blessed One was staying among the Kurus. Now there is a town of the Kurus called Kamasdhamma. There the Blessed One addressed the monks, monks. Lord, the monks responded to him. The Blessed One said, This is the direct path one for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and distress, for the attainment of the right method, and for the realization of unbinding, in other words, the four establishings of mindfulness. Which four? There is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on feelings, mind, mental qualities in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. A. Body And how does a monk remain focused on the body in and of itself? 1. There is a case where a monk, having gone to the wilderness, to the shade of a tree, or to an empty building, sits down folding his legs crosswise, holding his body erect and establishing mindfulness to the foe. Always mindful, he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Breathing in long, he discerns, I am breathing in long, or breathing out long, he discerns, I am breathing out long. Or breathing in short, he discerns, I am breathing in short, or breathing out short, he discerns, I am breathing out short. He trains himself, I will breathe in sensitive to the entire body. He trains himself, I will breathe out sensitive to the entire body. He trains himself, I will breathe in calming bodily fabrication. He trains himself, I will breathe out calming bodily fabrication. Just as a dexterous turner or his apprentice, when making a long turn, discerns, I am making a long turn, or when making a short turn. Discerns, I am making a short turn, in the same way the monk, when breathing in long, discerns, I am breathing in long, or breathing out long, he discerns, I am breathing out long. He trains himself, I will breathe in calming bodily fabrication. He trains himself, I will breathe out calming bodily fabrication. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 2. And further, 
When walking, the monk discerns, I am walking. When standing, he discerns, I am standing. When sitting, he discerns, I am sitting. When lying down, he discerns, I am lying down. Or however his body is disposed, that is how he discerns it. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both. Internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 3. And further, when going forward and returning, he makes himself fully alert, when looking toward and looking away. When flexing and extending his limbs, when carrying his outer cloak, his upper robe, and his ball, when eating, drinking, chewing, and saving, when urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and remaining silent, he makes himself fully alert. In this way he remains focused. Internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 4. And further, just as if a sack with openings at both ends were full of various kinds of grain, wheat, rice, mung beans, kidney beans, sesame seeds, husked rice, and a man with good eyesight, pouring it out, were to reflect, this is wheat. This is rice. These are mung beans. These are kidney beans. These are sesame seeds. This is husked rice. In the same way, the monk reflects on this very body from the soles of the feet on up, from the crown of the head on down, surrounded by skin and full of various kinds of unclean things. In this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, tendons, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen. Lungs, large intestines, small intestines, gorge, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, skin oil, saliva, mucus, fluid in the joints, urine. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 5. And further, just as a dexterous butcher or his apprentice, having killed a cow, would sit at a crossroads cutting it up into pieces, the monk reflects on this very body, however it stands, however it is disposed, in terms of properties, in this body there is the earth property, the liquid property, the fire property, and the wind property. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, 
or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 6. And further, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a charnel ground, one day, two days, three days dead, bloated, livid, and festering, he applies it to this very body, this body, too, such is its nature, such is its future, such its unavoidable fate. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. Or again, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a charnel ground, being chewed by crows, being chewed by vultures, being chewed by hawks, being chewed by dogs, being chewed by hyenas, being chewed by various other creatures, a skeleton smeared with flesh and blood, connected with tendons, a fleshless skeleton smeared with blood, connected with tendons, a skeleton without flesh or blood, connected with tendons, bones detached from their tendons, scattered in all. Directions, here a hand bone, there a foot bone, here a shin bone, there a thigh bone, here a hip bone, there a back bone, here a rib, there a chest bone, here a shoulder bone, there a neck. Bone, here a jaw bone, there a tooth, here a skull, the bones whitened, somewhat like the color of shells, the bones piled up, more than a year old, the bones decomposed into a powder. He applies it to this very body. This body, too, such is its nature, such is its future, such its unavoidable fate. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. B. Feelings And how does a monk remain focused on feelings in and of themselves? There is the case where a monk, when feeling a painful feeling, discerns, I am feeling a painful feeling. When feeling a pleasant feeling, he discerns, I am feeling a pleasant feeling. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he discerns, I am feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When feeling a painful feeling of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a painful feeling of the flesh. When feeling a painful feeling not of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a painful feeling not of the flesh. When feeling a pleasant feeling of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a pleasant feeling of the flesh. When feeling a pleasant feeling not of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a pleasant feeling not of the flesh. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling of the flesh. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling not of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling not of the flesh. In this way he remains focused internally on feelings in and of themselves, or externally on feelings in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on feelings in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to feelings, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to feelings, 
or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to feelings. Or his mindfulness that there are feelings is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on feelings in and of themselves. See a mind. And how does a monk remain focused on the mind in and of itself? There is the case where a monk, when the mind has passion, discerns, the mind has passion. When the mind is without passion, he discerns, the mind is without passion. When the mind has aversion, he discerns, the mind has aversion. When the mind is without aversion, he discerns, the mind is without aversion. When the mind has delusion, he discerns, the mind has delusion. When the mind is without delusion, he discerns, the mind is without delusion. When the mind is constricted, he discerns, the mind is constricted. When the mind is scattered, he discerns, the mind is scattered. When the mind is enlarged, he discerns, the mind is enlarged. When the mind is not enlarged, he discerns, the mind is not enlarged. When the mind is surpassed, he discerns, the mind is surpassed. When the mind is unsurpassed, he discerns, the mind is unsurpassed. When the mind is concentrated, he discerns, the mind is concentrated. When the mind is not concentrated, he discerns, the mind is not concentrated. When the mind is released, he discerns, the mind is released. When the mind is not released, he discerns, the mind is not released. In this way he remains focused internally on the mind in and of itself, or externally on the mind in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the mind in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the mind, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the mind, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the mind. Or his mindfulness that there is a mind is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the mind in and of itself. D. Mental Qualities and how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves? 1. There is the case where a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five hindrances. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five hindrances? There is the case where, there being sensual desire present within, a monk discerns, there is sensual desire present within me. Or, there being no sensual desire present within, he discerns, there is no sensual desire present within me. He discerns how there is the arising of unarisen sensual desire. And he discerns how there is the abandoning of sensual desire once it has arisen. And he discerns how there is no further appearance in the future of sensual desire that has been abandoned. The same formula is repeated for the remaining. Hindrances, ill will, sloth and drowsiness, restlessness and anxiety, and uncertainty. Dot. In this way, he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five hindrances. 2. And further the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five clinging aggregates. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five clinging aggregates? 
there is a case where a monk discerns such as form, such its origination, such its disappearance, such as feeling, such as perception, such are fabrications, such as consciousness, such its origination, such its disappearance. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five clinging aggregates. 3. And further, the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the sixfold internal and external sense media. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the sixfold internal and external sense media? There is the case where he discerns the eye, he discerns forms, he discerns the fetter that arises dependent on both. He discerns how there is the arising of an unrisen fetter. And he discerns how there is the abandoning of a fetter once it has arisen. And he discerns how there is no further appearance in the future of a fetter that has been abandoned. The same formula is repeated for the remaining sense media, ear, nose, tongue, body, and intellect. Dot. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the sixfold internal and external sense media. 4. And further, the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the seven factors for awakening. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the seven factors for awakening? There is the case where there being mindfulness as a factor for awakening present within, he discerns, mindfulness as a factor for awakening is present within me. Or, there being no mindfulness as a factor for awakening present within, he discerns, mindfulness as a factor for awakening is not present within me. He discerns how there is the arising of unarisen mindfulness as a factor for awakening. And he discerns how there is a culmination of the development of mindfulness as a factor for awakening once it has arisen. The same formula is repeated for the remaining factors for awakening. Analysis of qualities, persistence, rapture, calm, concentration, and equanimity. Dot. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the seven factors for awakening. 5. And further, 
the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the four noble truths. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the four noble truths? There is a case where he discerns. As it has come to be, that this is stress, this is the origination of stress, this is the cessation of stress, this is the way leading to the cessation of stress. A. Now what is the noble truth of stress? Birth is stressful, aging is stressful, death is stressful, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair are stressful, association with the unbeloved is stressful, separation from the loved is stressful, not getting what is wanted is stressful. In short, the five clinging aggregates are stressful. And what is birth? Whatever birth, taking birth, descent, coming to be, coming forth, appearance of aggregates, an acquisition of, sense, spheres of the various beings in this or that group of beings, that is called birth. And what is aging? Whatever aging, decrepitude, brokenness, graying, wrinkling, decline of life force, weakening of the faculties of the various beings in this or that group of beings, that is called aging. And what is death? Whatever deceasing, passing away, breaking up, disappearance, dying, death, completion of time, break up of the aggregates, casting off of the body, interruption in the life faculty of the various beings in this or that group of beings, that is called death. And what is sorrow? Whatever sorrow, sorrowing, sadness, inward sorrow, inward sadness of anyone suffering from misfortune, touched by a painful thing, that is called sorrow. And what is lamentation? Whatever crying, grieving, lamenting, weeping, wailing, lamentation of anyone suffering from misfortune, touched by a painful thing, that is called lamentation. And what is pain? Whatever is experienced as bodily pain, bodily discomfort, pain or discomfort born of bodily contact, that is called pain. And what is distress? Whatever is experienced as mental pain, mental discomfort, pain or discomfort born of mental contact, that is called distress. And what is despair? Whatever despair, despondency, desperation of anyone suffering from misfortune, touched by a painful thing, that is called despair. And what is the stress of association? With the unbeloved? There is a case where undesirable, unpleasing, unattractive sights, sounds, aromas, flavors, or tactile sensations occur to one, or one has connection, contact, relationship, interaction with those who wish one ill, who wish for one's harm, who wish for one's discomfort, who wish one no security from the yoke. This is called the stress of association with the unbeloved. And what is the stress of separation from the loved? There is the case where desirable, pleasing, attractive sights, sounds, aromas, flavors, or tactile sensations do not occur to one, or one has no connection, no contact, no relationship, no interaction with those who wish one well, who wish for one's benefit, who wish for one's comfort, who wish one's security from the yoke, nor with one's mother, father, brother, sister, friends, companions, or relatives. This is called the stress of separation from the loved. And what is the stress of not getting what is wanted? In being subject to birth, the wish arises, oh, may we not be subject to birth, and may birth not come to us. But this is not to be achieved by wishing. This is the stress of not getting what is wanted. In being subject to aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair, the wish arises, oh, may we not be subject to aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair, and may aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair not come to us. But this is not to be achieved by wishing. This is the stress of not getting what is wanted. 
And what are the five clinging aggregates that, in short, are stressful? The form clinging aggregate, the feeling clinging aggregate, the perception clinging aggregate, the fabrications clinging aggregate, the consciousness clinging aggregate, these are called the five clinging aggregates that, in short, are stressful. This is called the noble truth of stress. B. And what is the noble truth of the origination of stress? The craving that makes for further becoming, accompanied by passion and delight, relishing now here and now there, i.e. sensuality craving, becoming craving, and non-becoming craving. And where does this craving, when arising, arise? And where, when dwelling, does it dwell? Whatever is enduring and alluring in terms of the world, that is where. This craving, when arising, arises. That is where, when dwelling, it dwells. And what is enduring and alluring in terms of the world? The eye is enduring and alluring in terms of the world. That is where this craving, when arising, arises. That is where, when dwelling, it dwells. The ear. The nose. The tongue. The body. The intellect. Forms. Sounds. Aromas. Tastes. Tactile sensations. Ideas. Eye consciousness. Ear consciousness. Nose consciousness. Tongue consciousness. Body consciousness. Intellect consciousness. Eye contact. Ear contact. Nose contact. Tongue contact. Body contact. Intellect contact. Feeling born of eye contact. Feeling born of ear contact. Feeling born of nose contact. Feeling born of tongue contact. Feeling born of body contact. Feeling born of intellect contact. Perception of forms. Perception of sounds. Perception of aromas. Perception of tastes. Perception of tactile sensations. Perception of ideas. Intention for forms. Intention for sounds. Intention for aromas. Intention for tastes. Intention for tactile sensations. Intention for ideas. Craving for forms. Craving for sounds. Craving for aromas. Craving for tastes. Craving for tactile sensations. Craving for ideas. Thought directed at forms. Thought directed at sounds. Thought directed at aromas. Thought directed at tastes. Thought directed at tactile sensations. Thought directed at ideas. Evaluation of forms. Evaluation of sounds. Evaluation of aromas. Evaluation of tastes. Evaluation of tactile sensations. Evaluation of ideas is enduring and alluring in terms of the world. That is where this craving, when arising, arises. That is where, when dwelling, it dwells. This is called the noble truth of the origination of stress. See, and what is the noble truth of the cessation of stress? The remainder is Fading and cessation, renunciation, relinquishment, release, and letting go of that very craving. And where, when being abandoned, is this craving abandoned? And where, when ceasing, does it cease? Whatever is enduring and alluring in terms of the world, that is where, when being abandoned, this craving is abandoned. That is where, when ceasing, it ceases. And, and what is enduring and alluring in terms of the world? The eye is enduring and alluring in terms of the world. That is where, when being abandoned, this craving is abandoned. That is where, when ceasing, it ceases. The ear. The nose. The tongue. The body. The intellect. Forms, sounds, aromas, tastes, tactile sensations, 
ideas i consciousness your consciousness nose consciousness tongue consciousness body consciousness intellect consciousness i contact your contact nose contact tongue contact body contact intellect contact feeling born of eye contact feeling born of ear contact feeling born of nose contact feeling born of tongue contact feeling born of body contact feeling born of intellect contact perception of forms perception of sounds perception of aromas perception of tastes perception of tactile sensations perception of ideas intention for forms intention for sounds intention for aromas intention for tastes intention for tactile sensations intention for ideas craving for forms craving for sounds craving for aromas craving for tastes craving for tactile sensations craving for ideas thought directed at forms thought directed at sounds thought directed at aromas thought directed at tastes thought directed at tactile sensations thought directed at ideas evaluation of forms evaluation of sounds evaluation of aromas evaluation of tastes evaluation of tactile sensations evaluation of ideas is enduring and alluring in terms of the world that is where when being abandoned this craving is abandoned that is where when ceasing it ceases this is called the noble truth of the cessation of stress d and what is the noble truth of the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress just this very noble eightfold path right view right resolve right speech right action right livelihood right effort right mindfulness right concentration and what is right view knowledge with reference to stress knowledge with reference to the origination of stress knowledge with reference to the cessation of stress knowledge with reference to the way of practice leading to the cessation of stress this is called right view and what is right resolve resolve for renunciation resolve for freedom from ill will resolve for harmlessness this is called right resolve and what is right speech abstaining from lying from divisive speech from abusive speech and from idle chatter this is called right speech and what is right action abstaining from taking life from stealing and from sexual misconduct this is called right action and what is right livelihood there is a case where a disciple of the noble ones having abandoned dishonest livelihood keeps his life going with right livelihood this is called right livelihood and what is right effort there is a case where a monk generates desire endeavors arouses persistence upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the non arising of evil unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen for the sake of the abandoning of evil unskillful qualities that have arisen for the sake of the arising of skillful qualities that have not yet arisen and for the maintenance non confusion increase plenitude development and culmination of skillful qualities that have arisen this is called right effort and what is right mindfulness there is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself ardent alert and mindful subduing greed and distress with reference to the world he remains focused on feelings in and of themselves the mind in and of itself mental qualities in and of themselves ardent alert and mindful subduing greed and distress with reference to the world this is called right mindfulness and what is right concentration there is the case where a monk quite secluded from sensuality secluded from unskillful qualities enters and remains in the first jhana 
rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. With the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, he enters and remains in the second jhana, rapture and pleasure born of concentration, unification of awareness free from directed thought and evaluation, internal assurance. With the fading of rapture he remains equanimous, mindful, and alert, and senses pleasure with the body. He enters and remains in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful, he has a pleasant abiding. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. This is called right concentration. This is called the noble truth of the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the Four Noble Truths. E. Conclusion Now, if anyone would develop these four establishings of mindfulness in this way, for seven years, one of two fruits can be expected for him, either gnosis right here and now, or, if there be any remnant of clinging sustenance, non-return. Let alone seven years. If anyone would develop these four establishings of mindfulness in this way for six years, five, four, three, two years, one year, seven months, six months, five, four, three, two months, one month, half a month, one of two fruits can be expected for him, either gnosis right here and now, or, if there be any remnant of clinging sustenance, non-return. Let alone half a month. If anyone would develop these four establishings of mindfulness in this way for seven days, one of two fruits can be expected for him, either gnosis right here and now, or, if there be any remnant of clinging sustenance, non-return. This is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and distress, for the attainment of the right method, and for the realization of unbinding, in other words, the four. Establishings of Mindfulness Thus was it said, and in reference to this was it said. That is what the Blessed One said. Gratified, the monks delighted in the Blessed One's words. The Great Establishing of Mindfulness Discourse Mahasati Pahana Sutta DN 22 I have heard that on one occasion the Blessed One was staying among the Kurus. Now there is a town of the Kurus called Kamasdhamma. There the Blessed One addressed the monks, monks. Lord, the monks responded to him. The Blessed One said, This is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and distress, for the attainment of the right method, and for the realization of unbinding, in other words, the four establishings of mindfulness. Which four? There is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on feelings, mind, mental qualities in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. A. Body And how does a monk remain focused on the body in and of itself? 1. There is a case where a monk, having gone to the wilderness, 
to the shade of a tree or to an empty building sits down folding his legs crosswise holding his body erect and establishing mindfulness to the fore always mindful he breathes in mindful he breathes out breathing in long he discerns i am breathing in long or breathing out long he discerns i am breathing out long or breathing in short he discerns i am breathing in short or breathing out short he discerns i am breathing out short he trains himself i will breathe in sensitive to the entire body he trains himself i will breathe out sensitive to the entire body he trains himself i will breathe in coming bodily fabrication he trains himself i will breathe out coming bodily fabrication just as a dexterous turner or his apprentice when making a long turn discerns i am making a long turn or when making a short turn discerns i am making a short turn in the same way the monk when breathing in long discerns i am breathing in long or breathing out long he discerns i am breathing out long he trains himself i will breathe in coming bodily fabrication he trains himself i will breathe out coming bodily fabrication in this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself or externally on the body in and of itself or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance and he remains independent unsustained by not clinging to anything in the world this is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself two and further when walking the monk discerns i am walking when standing he discerns i am standing when sitting he discerns i am sitting when lying down he discerns i am lying down or however his body is disposed that is how he discerns it in this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself or externally on the body in and of itself or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance and he remains independent unsustained by not clinging to anything in the world This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 3 and further when going forward and returning he makes himself fully alert when looking toward and looking away when flexing and extending his limbs when carrying his outer cloak his upper robe and his ball when eating drinking chewing and saving when urinating and defecating when walking standing sitting falling asleep waking up talking and remaining silent he makes himself fully alert in this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself or externally on the body in and of itself or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance and he remains independent unsustained by not clinging to anything in the world this is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself four and further just as if a sack with openings at both ends were full of various kinds of grain wheat rice mung beans kidney beans sesame seeds husk rice and a man with good eyesight pouring it out were to reflect this is wheat this is rice these are mung beans these are kidney beans 
these are sesame seeds. This is husk rice, in the same way, the monk reflects on this very body from the soles of the feet on up, from the crown of the head on down, surrounded by skin and full of various kinds of unclean things, in this body there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, tendons, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, pleura, spleen, lungs, large intestines, small intestines, gorge, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, skin oil, saliva, mucus, fluid in the joints, urine. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 5. And further, just as a dexterous butcher or his apprentice, having killed a cow, would sit at a crossroads cutting it up into pieces, the monk reflects on this very body, however it stands, however it is disposed, in terms of properties, in this body there is the earth property, the liquid property, the fire property, and the wind property. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. 6. And further, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a charnel ground, one day, two days, three days dead, bloated, livid, and festering, he applies it to this very body, this body, too, such is its nature such is its future, such its unavoidable fate. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. Or again, as if he were to see a corpse cast away in a charnel ground, being chewed by crows, being chewed by vultures, being chewed by hawks, being chewed by dogs being chewed by hyenas, being chewed by various other creatures, a skeleton smeared with flesh and blood, connected with tendons, a fleshless skeleton smeared with blood, connected with tendons, a skeleton without flesh or blood, connected with tendons, bones detached from their tendons, scattered in all directions, here a hand bone, there a foot bone, here a shin bone, there a thigh bone, here a hip bone, there a back bone, here a rib, there a chest bone, here a shoulder bone, there a neck bone, here a jaw bone, there a tooth, here a skull, the bones whitened, somewhat like the color of shells, the bones piled up, more than a year old, the bones decomposed into a powder, he applies it to this very body, this body, too, such is its nature, such is its future, such its unavoidable fate. In this way he remains focused internally on the body in and of itself, or externally on the body in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the body in and of itself. 
or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the body, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the body, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the body. Or his mindfulness that there is a body is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself. B. Feelings And how does a monk remain focused on feelings in and of themselves? There is a case where a monk, when feeling a painful feeling, discerns, I am feeling a painful feeling. When feeling a pleasant feeling, he discerns, I am feeling a pleasant feeling. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he discerns, I am feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When feeling a painful feeling of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a painful feeling of the flesh. When feeling a painful feeling not of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a painful feeling not of the flesh. When feeling a pleasant feeling of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a pleasant feeling of the flesh. When feeling a pleasant feeling not of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a pleasant feeling not of the flesh. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling of the flesh, he discerns, I am feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling of the flesh. When feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling not of the flesh, he discerns. I am feeling a neither painful nor pleasant feeling not of the flesh. In this way he remains focused internally on feelings in and of themselves, or externally on feelings in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on feelings in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to feelings, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to feelings, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to feelings. Or his mindfulness that there are feelings is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on feelings in and of themselves. See a mind. And how does a monk remain focused on the mind in and of itself? There is a case where a monk, when the mind has passion, discerns, the mind has passion. When the mind is without passion, he discerns, the mind is without passion. When the mind has aversion, he discerns, the mind has aversion. When the mind is without aversion, he discerns, the mind is without aversion. When the mind has delusion, he discerns, the mind has delusion. When the mind is without delusion, he discerns, the mind is without delusion. When the mind is constricted, he discerns, the mind is constricted. When the mind is scattered, he discerns, the mind is scattered. When the mind is enlarged, he discerns, the mind is enlarged. When the mind is not enlarged, he discerns, the mind is not enlarged. When the mind is surpassed, he discerns, the mind is surpassed. When the mind is unsurpassed, he discerns, the mind is unsurpassed. When the mind is concentrated, he discerns, the mind is concentrated. When the mind is not concentrated, he discerns, the mind is not concentrated. When the mind is released, he discerns, the mind is released. When the mind is not released, he discerns, the mind is not released. In this way he remains focused internally on the mind in and of itself, or externally on the mind in and of itself, or both internally and externally on the mind in and of itself. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to the mind, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to the mind, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to the mind. Or his mindfulness that there is a mind is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on the mind in and of itself. D. Mental qualities And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves? 
One, there is a case where a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five hindrances. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five hindrances? There is a case where, there being sensual desire present within, a monk discerns, there is sensual desire present within me. Or, there being no sensual desire present within, he discerns, there is no sensual desire present within me. He discerns how there is the arising of unarising. Sensual desire And he discerns how there is the abandoning of sensual desire once it has arisen. And he discerns how there is no further appearance in the future of sensual desire that has been abandoned. The same formula is repeated for the remaining hindrances, ill will, sloth and drowsiness, restlessness and anxiety, and uncertainty. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five hindrances. 2. And further, the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five clinging aggregates. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five clinging aggregates? There is a case where a monk discerns such as form, such its origination, such its disappearance, such as feeling, such as perception, such are fabrications, such as consciousness, such its origination, such its disappearance. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the five clinging aggregates. 3. And further, the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the sixfold internal and external sense media. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the sixfold internal and external sense media? There is a case where he discerns the eye, he discerns forms, he discerns the fetter that arises dependent on both. He discerns how there is the arising of an unrisen fetter. And he discerns how there is the abandoning of a fetter once it has arisen. And he discerns how there is no further appearance in the future of a fetter that has been abandoned. The same formula is repeated for the remaining sense media, ear, nose, tongue, body, and intellect. Dot. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world.
This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the sixfold internal and external sense media. 4. And further, the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the seven factors for awakening. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the seven factors for awakening? There is the case where, there being mindfulness as a factor for awakening present within, he discerns, mindfulness as a factor for awakening is present within me. Or, there being no mindfulness as a factor for awakening present within, he discerns, mindfulness as a factor for awakening is not present within me. He discerns how there is the arising of. Unrisen mindfulness as a factor for awakening. And he discerns how there is a culmination of the development of mindfulness as a factor for awakening once it has arisen. The same formula is repeated for the remaining factors for awakening, analysis of qualities, persistence, rapture, calm, concentration, and equanimity. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the seven factors for awakening. 5. And further, the monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the four noble truths. And how does a monk remain focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the four noble truths? There is the case where he discerns, as it has come to be, that this is stress, this is the origination of stress, this is the cessation of stress, this is the way leading to the cessation of stress. A. Now what is the noble truth of stress? Birth is stressful, aging is stressful, death is stressful, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair are stressful, association with the unbeloved is stressful, separation from the loved is stressful. Not getting what is wanted is stressful. In short, the five clinging aggregates are stressful. And what is birth? Whatever birth, taking birth, descent, coming to be, coming forth, appearance of aggregates, an acquisition of, sense, spheres of the various beings in this or that group of beings, that is called birth. And what is aging? Whatever aging, decrepitude, brokenness, graying, wrinkling, decline of life force, weakening of the faculties of the various beings in this or that group of beings, that is called aging. And what is death? Whatever deceasing, passing away, breaking up, disappearance, dying, death, completion of time, breakup of the aggregates, casting off of the body, interruption in the life faculty of the various beings in this or that group of beings, that is called death. And what is sorrow? Whatever sorrow, sorrowing, sadness, inward sorrow, inward sadness of anyone suffering from misfortune, touched by a painful thing, that is called sorrow. And what is lamentation? Whatever crying, grieving, lamenting, weeping, wailing, lamentation of anyone suffering from misfortune, touched by a painful thing, that is called lamentation. And what is pain? Whatever is experienced as bodily pain, bodily discomfort, pain or discomfort born of bodily contact, that is called pain. And what is distress? Whatever is experienced as mental pain, mental discomfort, pain or discomfort born of mental contact, that is called distress. And what is despair? Whatever despair, despondency, Desperation of anyone suffering from misfortune, touched by a painful thing, that is called despair. 
And what is the stress of association with the unbeloved? There is the case where undesirable, unpleasing, unattractive sights, sounds, aromas, flavors, or tactile sensations occur to one, or one has connection, contact, relationship, interaction with those who wish one ill, who wish for one's harm, who wish for one's discomfort, who wish one no security from the yoke. This is called the stress of association with the unbeloved. And what is the stress of separation from the loved? There is the case where desirable, pleasing, attractive sights, sounds, aromas, flavors, or tactile sensations do not occur to one, or one has no connection, no contact, no relationship, no interaction with those who wish one well, who wish for one's benefit, who wish for one's comfort, who wish one's security from the yoke, no. With one's mother, father, brother, sister, friends, companions, or relatives. This is called the stress of separation from the loved. And what is the stress of not getting what is wanted? In being subject to birth, the wish arises, Oh, may we not be subject to birth, and may birth not come to us. But this is not to be achieved by wishing. This is the stress of not getting what is wanted. In being subject to aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair, the wish arises, Oh, may we not be subject to aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair, and may aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair not come to us. But this is not to be achieved by wishing. This is the stress of not getting what is wanted. And what are the five clinging aggregates that, in short, are stressful? The form clinging aggregate, the feeling clinging aggregate, the perception clinging aggregate, the fabrications clinging aggregate, the consciousness clinging aggregate, these are called the five. Clinging aggregates that, in short, are stressful. This is called the noble truth of stress. B. And what is the noble truth of the origination of stress? The craving that makes for further becoming, accompanied by passion and delight, relishing now here and now there, i.e. sensuality craving, becoming craving, and non-becoming craving. And where does this craving, when arising, arise? And where, when dwelling, does it dwell? Whatever is enduring and alluring in terms of the world, that is where this craving, when arising, arises. That is where, when dwelling, it dwells. And what is enduring and alluring in terms of the world? The eye is enduring and alluring in terms of the world. That is where this craving, when arising, arises. That is where, when dwelling, it dwells. The ear. The nose. The tongue. The body. The intellect. Forms. Sounds. Aromas. Flavors. Tactile sensations. Ideas. Eye consciousness. Ear consciousness. Nose consciousness. Tongue consciousness. Body consciousness. Intellect consciousness. Eye contact. Ear contact. Nose contact, tongue contact, body contact, intellect contact, feeling born of eye contact, feeling born of ear contact, feeling born of nose contact, feeling born of tongue contact, feeling born of body contact, feeling born of intellect contact, perception of forms, perception of sounds. Perception of aromas. Perception of flavors. Perception of tactile sensations. Perception of ideas. Intention for forms. Intention for sounds. Intention for aromas. Intention for flavors. Intention for tactile sensations. Intention for ideas. Craving for forms. Craving for sounds. 
craving for aromas craving for flavors craving for tactile sensations craving for ideas thought directed at forms thought directed at sounds thought directed at aromas thought directed at flavors thought directed at tactile sensations thought directed at ideas evaluation of forms evaluation of sounds evaluation of aromas evaluation of flavors evaluation of tactile sensations evaluation of ideas is enduring and alluring in terms of the world that is where this craving when arising arises that is where when dwelling it dwells this is called the noble truth of the origination of stress see and what is the noble truth of the cessation of stress the remainderless fading and cessation renunciation relinquishment release and letting go of that very craving and where when being abandoned is this craving abandoned and where when ceasing does it cease whatever is enduring and alluring in terms of the world that is where when being abandoned this craving is abandoned that is where when ceasing it ceases and what is enduring and alluring in terms of the world the eye is enduring and alluring in terms of the world that is where when being abandoned this craving is abandoned that is where when ceasing it ceases the ear the nose the tongue the body the intellect forms sounds aromas flavors tactile sensations ideas i consciousness ear consciousness nose consciousness tongue consciousness body consciousness intellect consciousness eye contact ear contact nose contact tongue contact body contact intellect contact feeling born of eye contact feeling born of ear contact feeling born of nose contact feeling born of tongue contact feeling born of body contact feeling born of intellect contact perception of forms perception of sounds perception of aromas perception of flavors perception of tactile sensations perception of ideas intention for forms intention for sounds intention for aromas intention for flavors intention for tactile sensations intention for ideas craving for forms craving for sounds craving for aromas craving for flavors craving for tactile sensations craving for ideas thought directed at forms thought directed at sounds thought directed at aromas thought directed at flavors thought directed at tactile sensations thought directed at ideas evaluation of forms evaluation of sounds evaluation of aromas evaluation of flavors evaluation of tactile sensations evaluation of ideas is enduring and alluring in terms of the world that is where when being abandoned this craving is abandoned that is where when ceasing it ceases this is called the noble truth of the cessation of stress d and what is the noble truth of the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress just this very noble eightfold path right view right resolve right speech right action right livelihood right effort right mindfulness right concentration and what is right view knowledge with reference to stress knowledge with reference to the origination of stress knowledge with reference to the cessation of stress knowledge with reference to the way of practice leading to the cessation of stress this is called right view and what is right resolve 
resolve for renunciation, resolve for freedom from ill. Will, resolve for harmlessness, this is called right resolve. And what is right speech? Abstaining from lying, from divisive speech, from abusive speech, and from idle chatter, this is called right speech. And what is right action? Abstaining from taking life, from stealing, and from sexual misconduct, this is called right action. And what is right livelihood? There is a case where a disciple of the noble ones, having abandoned dishonest livelihood, keeps his life going with right livelihood. This is called right livelihood. And what is right effort? There is a case where a monk generates desire, endeavors, arouses persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the non-arising of evil, unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen, for the sake of the abandoning of evil, unskillful qualities that have arisen, for the sake of the arising of skillful qualities that have not yet arisen. And, for the maintenance, non-confusion, increase, plenitude, development, and culmination of skillful qualities that have arisen. This is called right effort. And what is right mindfulness? There is the case where a monk remains focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on feelings in and of themselves, the mind in and of itself, mental qualities in and of themselves, ardent, alert, and mindful, subduing greed and distress with reference to the world. This is called right mindfulness. And what is right concentration? There is the case where a monk, quite secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful qualities, enters and remains in the first jhana, rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. With the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, he enters and remains in the second jhana, rapture and pleasure born of concentration, unification of awareness free from directed thought and evaluation, internal assurance. With the fading of rapture he remains equanimous, mindful, and alert, and senses pleasure with the body. He enters and remains in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, equanimous and mindful, he has a pleasant abiding. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. This is called right concentration. This is called the noble truth of the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress. In this way he remains focused internally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or externally on mental qualities in and of themselves, or both internally and externally on mental qualities in and of themselves. Or he remains focused on the phenomenon of origination with regard to mental qualities, on the phenomenon of passing away with regard to mental qualities, or on the phenomenon of origination and passing away with regard to mental qualities. Or his mindfulness that there are mental qualities is maintained to the extent of knowledge and remembrance. And he remains independent, unsustained by, not clinging to, anything in the world. This is how a monk remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves with reference to the four noble truths. E. Conclusion Now, if anyone would develop these four establishings of mindfulness in this way for seven years, one of two fruits can be expected for him, either gnosis right here and now, or, if there be any remnant of clinging sustenance, non-return. Let alone seven years. If anyone would develop these four establishings of mindfulness in this way for six years. Five, four, three, two years, one year, seven months, six months, five. Four, three, two months, one month. Half a month, one of two fruits can be expected for him. Either gnosis right here and now or, if there be any remnant of clinging sustenance, non-return. Let alone half a month. If anyone would develop these four establishings of mindfulness in this way for seven days, 
one of two fruits can be expected for him, either gnosis right here and now, or if there be any remnant of clinging sustenance, non-return. This is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and distress, for the attainment of the right method, and for the realization of unbinding, in other words, the four establishings of mindfulness. Thus was it said, and in reference to this was it said. That is what the Blessed One said. Gratified, the monks delighted in the Blessed One's words. Note, the word Parimukham is translated above as to the four. A more detailed analysis of the Pali word as per the Abhidharma text is. The Vibhaga of the Abhidhamma Piyaka, Aya Sati Uphit Hoti Suphit This awareness is set up, well set up. Nsikage Vyavit Macron Muknimitte Vyavit Macron At the tip of the nose or with the mouth face as an object. Tina Vakati Parimukha Sati Upapetvati This is called setting up the awareness Parimukha.